welcome to the program Perspectives. Perspectives this morning, we're also looking into a series on the state of the nation. Of course, um, we all do know that uh, it is becoming very worrisome about um, how the affairs of the country has been run. And uh, we know that um, from all the divides of the country, uh, people are calling for uh, Nigeria, Nigeria to be secured. Um, secured not only in terms of um, the protection of lives and property, economic security is there, and then we're also talking about uh, what uh, citizens can do to also secure the nation. Uh, what we're getting here, you know, uh, voices coming from all sides, and the voices are coming out as disturbing. Uh, some people are be beginning to call, you know, that um, we go our separate ways. But again, the uh, voice of reason would say that uh, more than any other time, it is one time to all have our hands on deck, you know, to move this country forward. Do tribe and tongue may differ, but um, we do have a stake in keeping Nigeria going. Uh, shared, sharing thoughts with me on this, uh, this morning, um, uh, I'll have Yusuf Donkufa, a professor of law at Madubilo University, Zaria, to lend voice to what um, is coming out of the Nigerian state. Professor Yusuf Nkufa, good morning and glad to have you on our show. Thank you very much. Good yeah. morning, Mr. Tony Alabi, yes. and good morning to all our esteemed listeners. I'd just like to start this way. Uh, when I heard uh, the President African Development Bank Group, um, I was talking about Adishino, I would come to tell Nigerians that uh, 87 million Nigerians are living in extreme, extreme poverty. 87 million. Now, uh, their poverty is general, but to confirm that 87 million are living in extreme poverty, that again would be seen as very worrisome. And of course, he had said that um, uh, highly vulnerable, uh, we are highly vulnerable to social and political risk uh, created. Uh, on the further of um, uh, anti-social behavior and uh, of course we are getting recruitments by insurgents and terrorists okay and high level of employment uh, unemployment uh, tied to these again we are getting you know what is coming out from Medukuri in Borno state as disturbing as it is um, killings of all on all sides and um, it is not going down of course we we'll all also acknowledge that the military it's not sitting on its uh, We're getting um, the retake of captured towns, you know, by Boko Haram. But again, um, security, 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 and the front burner in all of these. We're just asking, um, what has been left undone in all of these? Why? How can all of these be tied to um, a particular area of our life? And that, that we will talk about governance in, in here. Yeah, we're getting high risk of it. Terrorists, bandits, kidnapping, kidnappers, and all of that on the rise in our nation today. Why all of this is coming out to the fore, on the fall? And of course, some people have said that uh, because we did not plan for tomorrow, uh, we're getting what we're getting today. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Additional has just re-echoed what we all know by virtue of the United Nations statement about Nigeria some few years ago that uh, Nigeria is facing what it called a multi-dimensional poverty majority of Nigerians and uh, this means that uh, people largely are living in squalor a terrible conditions of deprivation and uh, where you have a population that is largely steeped in poverty you have a population that is in a state of melancholy confusion you know utter you know unhappiness so i don't know where some of this will get their statistics from that nigeria is supposed to be one of the most happiest nations in the world but as it is today that cannot be true uh despair is what you know defines most nigerians today and uh probably because of that poverty you find that recruitment into some of these terrorist groups 
or bandit becomes very easy because you know where people are deprived and opportunities are closed against them you realize that you know crime becomes attractive so the nigerian state itself you know is predatory in the context that it is only working for the few privileged class the few opportunities class so you can run a country where the inequality gap is so wide close to 70 percent of the population you know is in a state of tenor state of deprivation while very few privileged class continue to enjoy the homogeneous wealth of the nation so of course we have always argued that you know collapse of leadership has always been the problem uh, right from independence to date nigerian leaders have been predatory have been parasitic on the resources of the nation rather than you know entrenching welfare and protecting the people and therefore immediately after independence you could see from the division of the first generation rulers where there was there's always been a contest you know to you know to to, to defend you know political space uh, for those who are in power so that has always defined the leadership class in Nigeria of independence. When they get there, immediately after election, what they do is to continue to protect that political space and, you know, identify people that are supposed to be enemies, therefore abandon governance, get distracted, and be fighting, you know, for political space among themselves for the purpose of entrenching themselves in power. So that has always been the trajectory of leadership in Nigeria. So which is the political class has always been irresponsible, have always, you know, divested themselves from the real essence of power and governance. They see politics as a means of livelihood. You know, they see politics as an industry, a bread and butter condition. They do not see politics as a vehicle to serve their people. And um, between 1960 to 2014, statistics have shown that close to 400 billion U.S. dollars have been stolen by the Nigerian elites. These are monies that should have been spent to develop the nation in terms of infrastructure, in terms of human capacity development, in terms of industrialization, in terms of education, health care, provision of health care services. So, yes, I agree that because our leaders failed to plan for today, that was that's where we're having this problem. And unfortunately, they have still refused to plan because to them, you know, politics is nothing but a vehicle for them to continue to enjoy power and uh, also the tax and benefit that come from power. What they engage in is nothing but aguada politics. And like we said, you know, for you to understand this perspective, you go through the system of budgeting. Uh, for example, the uh, UNESCO have advised nation states that they should at least spend close to 26% of their budgets on education. But in Nigeria, we only spend 6 to 7% of our budget on education, while 60 or 70% goes on the current that affects the leadership class. So you, you, you begin to wonder, when you see budget, both at federal and state level, you see close to 1 billion year marked for feeding, close to 1 billion year marked for gener generators, and how to fill it, close to 5 billion year marked for in international travels for our leadership class at the expense of the real, you know, development that is meant for the people. Rather than stimulate growth and development, they don't. And they, they should be ashamed that to date, Nigeria still remains, you know, a country that is not productive. It is still import dependent nation. And uh, no country can become prosperous without industrialization. No country can become prosperous without, you know, uh, stopping the influx of foreign goods. 
into its country because it will not allow local industries to, to, to grow if they are any. So I think the economic outlay of governments like, right from independence till day is really shaky because there is no agenda for industrialization. As a matter of fact, what continually happens in Nigeria is deindustrialization because you see that some of these companies now that have long had a long history of operations in Nigeria, some of them keep moving out of Nigeria and go to neighboring countries. So, for as long as growth and development will not be stimulated through industrialization, especially in the area of agriculture, where we have so many resources in terms of landmass, in terms of, you know, uh, topography, in terms of rainfall, you know, and also animal husbands. So you begin to wonder that in this country, you know, there is really no industries that put milk from the vast areas of animals that we have that produce, you know, milk and other necessary ingredients, you know, that comes out of cattle ranching or cattle rearing. Yeah, yeah bro, so, bro. Uh, yes, um, going going into that uh, again, military incursion. Uh, you know, some public affairs analysts would say that uh, you know more than any other time, it is time to look at military incursion in uh, you know public space in Nigeria. That uh, what we're getting today is the damage that was done you know in areas of you know, of governance. Military incursions would be seen as uh, dictatorship, authoritarianism, and all of that, and so. We see in Nigeria today that even in you know in his grave, a military head of state still still keeps Nigeria going by so much money that um, is gotten you know, from um, the wealth of you know commonwealth of a nation that has been stolen. And so, uh, what military dictatorship do, did was that um, it empowered people, you know, their cronies and um, not minding tribe, not minding religion, not minding everything. So it set the space for the. You know, corruption, mind-boggling corruption that we are seeing now, and of course, uh, uh, a defenseless nation like Nigeria today, what it is going through in terms of uh, securing lives and property. So, more than any other time in this space of um, the life of Nigeria, military caution would be seen as the big damage that has been done to Nigeria. Would you go with this? Uh, to some extent, because uh, yeah, the military caution you know, uh, has really had a negative impact on the political development of this country and also its socio-economic, you know, uh, progress. But, um, of course, we had cause to have some progressive military rule. For example, the Motola Muhammad, you know, of, of course it was short-lived, and also the Buhari Diagbo administration that was short-lived too. So, yeah, to some extent, the military, you know, was part of the problem, but this becomes inexcusable within the context that from 1998 to date, the civilian political class has been in control and if they were visionaries, if they were transformational, if they were creative, if they had a, a lot of commitment or patriotism, you know, to Nigeria states, we won't be where we are today. Because from 1999 to date, especially during the PDP regime, the amount of money Nigeria made, you know, and the savings we had were all frittered away because we're very selfish you know, a political class that is plutocratic, that is the wealth that seeks to become wealthy as government. So, I would not totally subscribe to the argument that the military, you know, decapitated Nigeria 100%. Yes, they had their own negativity, you know, as an impact on Nigerian states. But from 1999 to date, there can't be any excuse because at that point, the political class will have come together and realize that they, they, they have a mandate that is rooted in the constitution and other extant law that is to provide good governance you know for nigeria is the end constitution chapter two or uh, fundamental objectives and directive principles of state government is, is a compass you know of course we know that people cannot go to court to challenge government but it's a compass it's a direction you know for the government to be able to bring nigeria out of this present morass and also the, the basic you know essence of governance is welfare delivery to the people and to secure the people and welfare delivery means you know to appropriate the sources of the people for the people not 
for the government to appropriate sources of the state for themselves alone. Because as it were now, the civilian regime, you know, popularized this saying of government of the few, by the few and for the few in Nigeria. And not the necessary uh, conception, uh, concept of democracy that we know as government of the people for the people by the people. So you realize that the civilian regime did not fare any better. Some of them are even more authoritative, you know, like military regime. Look at it, some states, the way the governors behave as if they are emperors. You know, the way they, they the way they harass op- opposition leaders, the way they harass everybody, the way they bring in policies that is inimical, you know, to the growth of their people, policies that are selfish, policies that are essentially anti-people. So, the argument has always been that the major chunk of Nigeria's problems lies with the political class, the civilian political class, because they had the opportunity to redress, you know, the imbalance that the military brought, you know, uh, fostered on us. And for shifting that responsibility, they are indeed capable, you know, in the distortions that define the underdevelopment of Nigeria as of today. We're having a situation today where, um, well, forced to, some people say that we're forced to negotiate with terrorists or to negotiate with criminals. Um, that's how bad the situation is today. And then when you begin to look at that, where you know lives and property cannot be secured by those that have been given uh, the constitutional authority to do that. And um, again, the call that um, civilians should come out and defend themselves. And uh, what does what is that saying to, to leadership here? It is simply saying that leaders have abdicated their functions because the terrorists, the bandits are more powerful than the leaders. So which means you have government within government. Because for crying out loud, the basic essence of governance is protections of life and property and then welfare for the people. So the moment government is unable to do this, it has failed. Simplicity. And you begin to wonder, why are these bandits, you know, more powerful than government? At least by the fact that they are unable, you know, to be tamed. Why, why, why are they living as if they are larger than the entire country? I mean, why have certain areas been ceded, you know, onto these criminal elements? Why would some few vagabonds transact a city or a town, you know? In a country that is sovereign, that has its military fully equipped, that is supposed to have technology, and has a lot of appropriation for military activities, for security activities. So you begin to wonder, the reason is true. Either there is connivance with the criminals by government agencies, or the government is grossly incapable, incompetence on the part of government. So what we have at hand is an emergency because people are being killed in torrents. It, they have become so daring. The criminal elements have become so daring that they will stroll into people's houses in urban centers, kidnap to, the, to their own pleasure, kill to their own pleasure. And uh, nothing happens. And we are even, you see, we will have reports. We get reports that we are security agencies are uh, abducted or kidnapped, they pay ransom. So it has emboldened, you know, this criminal element and also gives some form of validation because the society is in a state of fear and those that are in charge of government are unable to use the machinery of authority, you know, and all the intelligence, you know, to make sure that they nip this problem in the board. So we have emergency. And which means there is a breakdown of law and order. Because the moment there is this kind of crisis, this kind of anarchy, this kind of banditry, which means there is a breakdown of law and order, which means everybody is for himself and government is no longer for people. And that is the context in which we view the statement of the Minister of Defense. Because the responsibility, constitutionally and statutory, to protect Nigerians lies on the government. And they must do everything possible. They must deploy hardware, resources, finances, train men and officers, you know, that will do this job. But we 
Well, the security, you know, agencies themselves are not being encouraged by not getting the right emolument, insurance, protection. You find instances where some men, men and officers in the military, you know, will run away from the theater of war against these criminal elements. Because one, they keep arguing that they don't have even enough equipment, that some of these bandits have more sophisticated weapons. So essentially, our borders are so porous that arms just come in anyhow. And the movement of people, both legal and illegal, you know, is so pronounced within our borders that these are things that continue to exaggerate the problems of insecurity. Where these criminal elements have more sophisticated weapons, where we are unable to even use technology, you know, to track them in bushes. So, Nigeria itself is not developing because we don't have the wherewithal, or is it that we don't have the political will? That TPRS will show you clearly the spot in which people are. It will show you clearly, it will lead you to where they are. We see because we don't deploy technology, Nigerian military will go into these bushes and at times kill innocent villagers. Who are the victims of this insurgency? So, what is happening is totally unacceptable. It has shown that government, you know, is confused as to how to even govern how to, you know, protect people within the construction of the law, how to discharge its own statutory responsibility, and which is, if care is not taken, if government is not proactive and does something about it, this how we we'll go to the end of the tunnel of this government, which is in 2023. Well, Prof, you, you talked about uh, responsibility, and I want to quickly bring in responsibility of citizens too in matters of governance um, you know some analysts would say that um, we have a gullible uh, gullible citizenship where you know we take everything hook line and sinker without you know uh, looking at um, the benefits that are there and of course um, what are the things that are just not good enough for us to take I want to talk about leadership here now and, and uh, why is it that uh, leadership in Nigeria is being owned, you know, owned in the sense that we look at our regions, we look at our religion, we look at our, you know, um, ethnic divides to claim leadership. And that, again, could be feeling the problem of, you know, that we have in Nigeria. I didn't get that question. Yeah, I was just going to talk the, the responsibility of um, followership here. Yeah. Uh, but just before we get to that, uh, Prof, let me just quickly go for a, a commercial break. I'll, I'll be back with you shortly. Okay. Welcome back. Is the program Perspectives this morning, and uh, in a series, in our series of uh, State of the Nation, where you know inviting guests on the program to talk about um, you know uh, what we have going for us in this country, and of course um, the noises that we get in from all sides and. Uh, the divides of the country, disturbing as it is, and um, what you know, preferring solutions to um, you know the problems of, of the country. Professor Yusuf Nkufa, a professor of law at Madibelo University, Zaria, my guest this morning. Um, well, Prof, just before we went on that break, I was you know going to talk about the responsibility of our citizens, um, a nation that has, you know, aspires to grow great and be great, must have um, citizens, you know, all you know, uh, together working for the good of this country. But what we're getting again, that um, leadership is being owned by the divides of this country. When I say owned by the divides of this country, we see a situation where things might just be going wrong, but again, because of the leaning, so where leadership comes from, uh, you know, citizens from that divide don't see any anything wrong with whatever is done. And so um, how can, you know, uh, citizens, uh, citizens' responsibility be claimed by all, uh, you know, what is wrong and how, how do we get it right here? Yeah. See, don't forget that a union is about government and the government coming together under social contracts, which means the people surrender their rights to the government, some of their rights to the government, for government to superintend, you know, over their state. I expected that government would be fair. But where there is absence of social justice, where the state 
is not being run on the principles of law and egalitarian conditions. Where people feel marginalized, where people are alienated, excluded from the benefits of the economic prosperity of their country, where people are excluded from the political, you know, uh, processes of their country, you know, and furthermore, where people are being fostered upon with poverty, and where largely. People cannot educate their children because public education has collapsed and private education that is basically monetized has taken place of public education and therefore the vast majority of people do not have the capital to send their children to school. We have people who die of basic things as maternal mortality. There is no Medicare for people. So where you have large majority of people under this state of melancholy, how do you expect support for the state? How do you expect them not to sabotage the system? That's what we say. Where you have too much poverty, the people themselves will be a good crowd in which criminals will be protected. So how do you now expect them to support a system? Because one, they have been enslaved. They have been oppressed. They have been terrorized. You know, they have been deprived of the resources of their state. They have not been educated. You know, and more, or more so, the state is being run along class division. You know, the privileged class and the non-privileged class, which means that anything you want in this country can only be done if, like they say, man no man, connection. So the you know, there's no meritocracy. The fellowship don't benefit. There's no merit. The children of the poor, no matter how qualitative they are, or no matter their standing in terms of education, will not be accorded the same opportunity as children of the privileged class. Go to some of these uh, very viable statutory corporations. I see that it's still by the children of the, of, of the privileged class. The children of the poor end up as taxi drivers, end up as security personnel that earns 30000 every month. So there is an entrenchment of a case system. Opportunities that is meant for everybody has been privileged, you know, for very few. Scholarship, for example. How many children of the poor get scholarship? So when you have this kind of arrangement, a system that exploits the vast majority, a country that is not working for the vast majority, but working for people. How do you expect cooperation from the people? It was part of an argument on this NSAS, you know, violence. So you cannot continue to keep people in this kind of perpetual economic bondage and exploitation and forced poverty on them. And you expect that, you know, there will not be implosion sometimes. There will be. Because Pent up frustration demands that at some point in history there'll be implosion. And that is why in advanced countries they make sure that there is social justice, there is equity in the distribution of resources. So as not to promote anger, not to trigger dissent, violent dissent. Because the moment there is absence of social justice, for example, the aged have been taken care of. The poor have been taken care of, the vulnerable have been taken care of. There is what they call social benefits, unemployment benefits. So you find a society that is very, very particular about all classes of people. Transportation system, medical for them. The poor can access transportation, the poor can access hospital for NHS. So you are bound to have the poor in those countries to support the system. The immigration to support the system. The police to support the system. But where in this country, police live in shanties. They even buy their uniforms. They have to go on the streets, you know, to, to go ask people to give them money. Their emoluments are not being paid. They live in shanties. How do you expect total commitment, patriotism to the cause of the nation? The immigration officer, who has not been dealt with, fairly, who 
rubble of the borders and make it porous and allow Gentiles from other countries to enter Nigeria. So we must have to give Nigeria a sense of a past where people, you know, are not wasted, where human resources are not wasted, where human capital are harnessed, people are educated, people are empowered, there's industrialization to create wealth and prosperity for people, like you see in advanced economies. Well, uh, Prof, at this time, w would it just be right, you know, uh, some people have described Nigeria to be in, in a, you know, that is, it is a contraption and, and that uh, uh, unholy alliance and uh, we just did not get it right from, from the start that, um, you know, you know, going our separate ways would have been, you know, what would have, you know, uh, been good for this, uh, for the good of the nation. Are you seeing that coming out now, where more than any other time, you, you know, loud voices are coming from different divides of Nigeria and all talking, you know, talking to uh, our religion, talking to our ethnicity and talking to our divides. Could this just be the problem that, uh, at the formative days of Nigeria? It is still the collapse of leadership. And don't forget, when leaders fail, they now stoke the embers of division. When leaders fail, they now try to use divide and rule tactics. They now bring in religion. They now try to divide people along ethno-religious, you know, the demographies because they have failed. Now, the outside leader who has failed will always want to show his people that, look, the problem is the Igbo or Yoruba. The Yoruba leaders that have failed we want to show to the world that it is the outside leaders that is the problem. So, because people are largely ignorant, they buy into this and they, they validate this nefarious, you know, position of leadership class. Because, for example, the Niger Delta agitation, yes, generally it could be out of marginalization. But what will shock you is that the Niger Delta never calls its leaders into account. That is the money that goes into Niger Delta from derivation, the 30 percent derivation. The money that goes to Niger Delta through NNDC. You know, these monies are in the hands of their leaders. Where is this money? That's that's the starting point. Demand for public accountability from their local leaders. So, because their local leaders have embezzled this money, they will not tell them that the problem is the Nigerian arrangement. There is no problem with Nigerian arrangement. If the leadership class has been united right from the onset, I see Nigeria as a country that they must grow. I see Nigeria as a country that demands patriotism for them. But they do not see Nigeria as that. That's why when there's contest for power, a group breathes out, the group starts shouting marginalization. Dubiously. Because it has lost out. And you could see from those agitating for some of these separatist agenda today, they were in government yesterday. They were like President Obama's job that is talking about restructuring today. What is the restructure? For instance, there was a national debate. There were local areas. He said, no, you can't debate Nigeria's unity. But today, if one that said Nigeria cannot function without, you know, without some of this uh, restructuring, that it is allowed during the national discourse during this time. So you can see the dubiousness of some of our leaders. They promote this kind of division, this kind of damage based on political interest. Or is it us if I get chips to negotiate for politics? That is why it is incumbent for the poor to understand that it is the government that is the problem and not the other ethnic man. The Hausa man should know that the Yoruba man is not his problem, is not his enemy. The Hausa peasants. She has the same problem with the evil peasants. The same threat, existential threat that is facing the evil man is the same that is facing the house of man. And that it is their leaders that exploit them. And top and leadership class, they are united. They are neither Igbos nor Yorubas, but no houses, but the same members of the political class. They are neither Christian or Muslim, but the same people. 
I want it to work very well. Why is it that a president is a Muslim, his vice is a Christian, and they work well? A president can be a Christian and the vice be a Muslim, and they work well. They never, you know, disagree or religious grounds. <laughs> so you could see, you know, the ploy, the political ploy, because the political class knows that its agenda is about exploitation and expropriation of people's resources for them to warehouse into advanced economy. Metropolitan capitals. They try, you know, to trigger some of these cleavages so that the Hausa man will perpetually be angry that the problem is the evil. And we do not empower. How does it translate into benefit for the people in the north? So I think the earlier the peasants understand that the demand for good governance and public accountability should be universal amongst all of us, the better for us. Let, let me quickly go to the audience now to be part of this conversation and um, numbers to call to be part of it this morning, 81 40989 or 70 87 Your calls now. Hello, good morning. My big color, good morning. A salute. Good morning, Eloy. Good morning. Yes. Kure is the name. Let's uh, hear you. I welcome you again. Thank you, Kure. Let's hear you. Uh, thank you. Honestly, anytime I have you, I guess, I always create time to sit down and be hearing what you're saying. Uh, in Nigeria today, we don't know. The politicians have taken us for granted. That's why they are doing us what they know how to do. So back, as I was in secondary school, the same secondary school you finish. I don't know the difference between a Muslim and a Christian. But the politicians now are trying by all means to separate us. But God will surely give us somebody that will take us to that real land. Me, I don't I don't know, I don't want to know. If you remember Lord, there was a time you are, I interviewed uh, somebody about uh Buhari heading uh, this uh, petroleum minister. I told you whether it's his son is the a petroleum minister, I don't want to know. But let him give us dividend of democracy. Never did I know that uh, where I'm, I'm just going to the ocean of river and I'll be batting, so will be entering my uh, in my eyes. So all we want, we need dividend of democracy. And we want to have purity. That's just why we demand. Okay. People can and take, I don't demand much. Only okay. few things. But uh. they are taking us for granted. Who will surely give us that leader? Have a wonderful day. Right, Thank you on that. I will see what it calls. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning, sir. Yes, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much. I speak to Mr. Jibril from Nasarawa. Okay, Mr. Jibril. All right, let's hear you. Yes, sir. I, I presume the topic of discussion is uh, about Nigeria leadership, performance of Nigeria. Am I correct? No, where we are with Nigeria, not only on leadership. Where we are, okay, the state of the Nigeria, nation. Yes. yes. So my, if leader, the leaders of the, in Nigeria are passed, not the current administration. In the previous administration, actually, I may have said that Nigeria leaders, that one way or the other, failed. But the current, the current administration, right, there's no air of <coughs> In this, the failures are noticed for me. Even we, the masses, we are the problem of this country. Mm. Who are calling for the problem of X? Right? They are the, the problem behind Nigeria. They are, they are the one behind Nigeria problem. Mm. You, are, you see somebody promoting atmosphere, promoting ethnicity, and the same, the same person complains that the leader has failed. And what the what capacity the leader has failed? Okay. Why you are promoting ethnicity? Right? Mm. People have been living together. Look at the issue of in the in the south, in the southern part of the country. It is supposed to be like that. Okay. Where the southern are attacking Fulani for just no reason. That on the ground that the Fulani headman, uh, uh, the same southern they are living in the north here. No northern have attacked them. Okay, right? Mr. Jimmy. And is that not the division? Then we are we are with the masses. We are centered to our problem, not any government. Okay. All right. Right. Okay, if somebody will sit down at home, eat food so he still drink or go join them, and come to media to say rubbish, 
And then they will complain that it is the government. It is not government. We are we the masses. We are students. We are instrumental to the problem of this country. Okay, we got we, you, we, uh, Mr. Jibril. We got you, uh, Mr. Jibril. We'll, we'll take one more, and then we'll come back to our, our guest. Hello, good morning. Hello, Mr. Ole. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this Friday. Friday. Yeah, calling from Agua. Let's hear you. About, about the state of the nation, I think uh, I would say major uh, major problem are uh, caused by the government. Because uh, when you start giving amnesty to criminals and uh, other people who stand up, start, start up at, at their own, then what do we expect? I think it's high time the government bring the, the people together, at least forget the tribe, the, the tribe and the religion. Let's come together and empower people so that this nation can move forward. Okay. Because this insecurity is not giving us what we want. Mm. It's not helping us at all. Mm. Rather, we are just creating another havoc for the next generation to come. Oh, all right. I hope God will help us. Yeah. Okay, uh, Friday, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you now, Prof. Um, Kure, Mr. Jibril, and uh, Friday. Uh, I've all spoken from different angles. And uh, Kure was saying that uh, at one time in the life of this nation, it didn't matter whether you were Christian or a Muslim or whatever tribe, that, that we, it all worked for us. You know, we saw ourselves as brothers and sisters. Here we are today, um, all going our separate ways. And um, uh, Jibril also talked about uh, the problem of um, the, you know, the followership here, that um, uh, followership are also part of the problem that we have in Nigeria, that um, they, 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 they feel the embers of our religion, uh, tribe, and all of that, yeah. Friday calling for us to, you know, um, be our brother's keepers and um, all have our hands on deck to move Nigeria forward. Your thoughts, yeah? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, I agree that uh, times were when there were no divisions, at least marked divisions in Nigeria. People mm -hmm. didn't know whether they are Muslims or Christians, they were living together, mm -hmm. you know. But like I said, you know, <clears throat> it has always been a boy used by bankrupt leadership to divide the people so as to take their minds away from their shortcomings and political iniquities. And until we all realize that, that they've been using us against ourselves, and that the real problem is the leadership class that is, you know, uh, devoid of critical thinking and does not have the political will out of its selfishness to grow and develop Nigeria. And uh, leadership is not uh, a party. Leadership is about taking up responsibility, about how to develop a nation. So. The leadership period in Nigeria, you know, uh, is inept, you know, and of course, uh, like I said, you know, very parasitic, you know, uh, to resources, so they are just there to benefit themselves alone. So Nigerians, you know, the electorate must also, you know, move away from stomach infrastructure to voting credible leaders. Because if not, this problem will continue to fester. It's going to, to deepen. And before we know it, it will have gotten to a stage where we no longer trust ourselves. Because the degree of mutual suspicion now, you know, can still be downplayed if we have visionary leaders. If not, if we march into 2013 with leaders of this kind of temperament, of this kind of, you know, identities, then we're in trouble. Because we want national leaders, you know, there will be patriotic to national cause, not leaders that will be divisive. So I agree that, uh, you know, the Nigerian state is not as if, you know, of course it has its problem, but it's not as if it cannot work. It's not working because the leadership, you know, benefits from its lack of functionality. Leadership benefits. If people should forget about their division and come together, you realize that people will now demand for accountability from government. People will face government and demand for public accountability. Look, tell us what you have done with our resources. But they don't want that to happen. And why would that not happen? By keeping people in perpetual state of poverty, deprivation, lack of education, and disunity. All right, I will say have, have some calls here. Still coming in. Um, hello, good morning. 
Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning also to your guests. Yes. Good morning. In fact, the guests have spoken the minds of millions of Nigerians. My question is, sir, why is it difficult for the president, for example, to call National Council of uh, State? People like Obatinjo, Gawan, and others will also add their voice. Two, why can't they coordinate these people who say that they are going to go and talk to the tourists, for example, like Wumi and others? If they coordinated them, ask them which areas can they be able to handle, just as Wumi is doing. Because Wumi has already even come out and said that uh, uh, kidna- uh, the kidnappers are not tourists, but the Boko has um, they have international backing. So I think the government should come down try as much as possible to see that these people who want to assist, the governors have also come out with that uh, they want to fight insecurity. I think if you find from a single angle, a centralized something, so that uh, Nigeria will be able to know which focus we are doing. And the government should try on her own to declare most of these groups so that the Nigerian army will be focused on who to meet. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I'm really good, bro. Uh, well, Prof, um, on this. Hello, uh, Prof. <coughs> Hello? Yes, Prof. Yes, yes, yes. You see, you see, the idea that the president should call for a council of state meeting, you know, we keep we keep saying that, you see, the people that are benefiting from this, you know, chaos will not solve the problem. It's very difficult. So, I mean, that has been the trajectory. There might be some few people in government, you know, like Mr. President, of course, people have attested to his sincerity, people have attested to... To his responsibility, but you are talking about an entire political class, you know. So unless and until you know, people try to you know accept the reality that look, they need a shift from the present political class and try to look to you know uh, non-career politicians in politics. What do I mean by 2023? People should try to identify candidates, irrespective of their political class. Or people should move out of the mainstream political parties, the two mainstream political parties, and go elsewhere. You see, uh, uh, Professor Mogalu came out last election. But because people are so steeped in their naive thoughts that it's only PDP and APC that have structure, Nigeria didn't even give him, you know, a, a look. They didn't even consider, despite the fact that he had so many good programs on paper. At least we should be thinking of moving away from these regular positions, try to see how to vote in, you know, credible people, people that will feel, you know, a transformation, people that have a good political pedigree, people that have sacrificed, you know. So unless and until we move away from this present political class and try to see how we can identify people, good people in those political parties and other political parties and what they need, then we must start to redeem our country. We must start to reclaim our country rather. But if not, and we allow the problem to persist, then, which means we are doing things over and over, trying to use the same one-out solutions, you know, in order to achieve you know, our aim. It's not going to work. All right, it's not going to use worn-out ideas, you know, expert ideas over the same problem. It's not going to, it's not going to work. Professor Isu Nkufa, I'd like to thank you so very much for coming on the program this morning. Thank you very much. Yes. And that's um, perspectives for today. Uh, again, looking at uh, the state of the nation, uh, we're proffering uh, solutions to how we can get ourselves together and get the nation moving. Professor Yusuf Nkufa, a professor of law at Mandibillo University, Zaria, my guest this morning. We'll come back with perspectives tomorrow. And uh, Dorcas, thank you for connecting us with the people. Have a good day.